So let me start. Uh, my name is Laura Castro, I'm a researcher at the University of A Coruña. And I'm here today with Vicky and Natalia. And I'm here today, we are here today to defy Philip II of Macedon, Julius Caesar, and Napoleon, no less. And why? Because, well, while they lived in different ages, they all had something in common. Well, they built their empires, and they did so with one motto divide and conquer, I'm sure you've heard of it. So why we want to defy these three men? Well, we are here to define them because while we're not really fond of stone faces, we're not interested in having our stone in, our face in stone in a museum. If you are, well, maybe you're not, uh, not, not really particularly fond of this, uh, uh, of what we are going to present here. But we're going to argue that as a community, uh, the being community, we achieve much more. And come on, we are in the 21st century, right? So uh, bear with me and let us uh, see why and how it's better to unite and conquer. Let's uh, look at the being community, as I was saying. So uh, we've been using this uh, label for a while, but what is a community? If we, can, if we would want to put it simply, we would say, well, it's uh, just a gathering of people that have something in common, like these three emperors that had the, their motto. They, they wanted, they love to do things in a certain way. Um, is that it? I mean, yeah, I do have in common with Natalia and Vicky that I love the, the beam, I love the, the technology. That's something that I use as a tool and as a goal and uh, the ecosystem that we are comfortable in and that we've been growing our, our careers. But probably if it's not in a rational way, at some level we all know that it's not, there's something more to it, to a community, right? And we, we also know at some level that are good communities that are much, much better communities that are, there are even toxic communities. So there must be something else, right? What has made the beam a community? And as uh, Martin was saying earlier on, uh, we were not a community, at least not with that label forever, right? So people uh, that uh, are passionate, that are enthusiasts of Erlang, have been gathering for, for quite some time, since the early 90s. So even more than a decade that, than Ericsson released uh, the technology Erlang, uh, the language as open source. But uh, then uh, we call them user conferences. Later on, they were called Erlang factories. So there was a lot of, uh, going on around the Erlang uh, name, right? So that was the center. So it was something in the building, uh, but we were not quite there yet. So they were enthusiasts, as, as also um, Francesco mentioned. But then something happened. And I will argue around 1020, right? Uh, 10, <laughs> 20 times, sorry. Um, but it didn't also happen that. Lots of things followed. And I think that was, uh, for me, that was the, the breakthrough. So lots of different personalities, different approaches with one common soul appeared. So we kind of shifted from having one language to having lots of ways of expressing something we were still passionate about, the distributed environment and how we concurrently build things that scaled up a lot. And we, now we could do that in different flavors. But it was not only the technical part, it was that Doing, in doing so, in, in happening, this process allowed us to reach to lots of different um, minds, lots of different experience, lots of different developers, lots of different people, lots of, lots of different projects. I think that's when we became a community. We stopped uh, using that Erlang uh, label for everything and we recognized that there were no user conferences anymore. We, we now uh, call them uh, cult things, and we do have even an ecosystem foundation. Uh, so I think that is when the community uh, identity consolidated, right? So that was when we actually became a community. And there are lots and lots of projects, as I was saying, in this community, and there were projects before. So what happened with the projects? What do the projects that we have in the community now have that help building that identity? 
that are uh, really good tools for people to join or for people to stay within the community. And there are lots and lots of things that uh, we could uh, mention, but I will uh, pick a, uh, a few of them. So uh, they're really, there are projects that build the community, that build the identity of the community because they, they are vehicles for research uh, to go from academia to the industry. Like really a state of the art industry, uh, state of the art research, research that gets to industry in really short times. There are vehicles for startups to, to appear. As I was saying, there are vehicles to new contributors because uh, there's been a lot of effort in uh, really approachable tutorials. Uh, there are lots of uh, projects in the community now that have labels for issues to uh, start contributing. Documentation is now something that we pay a lot of, of attention to. Lots of projects uh, have integration in mind from the very beginning. So they, they offer APIs for other platforms, for other technologies. Uh, open source is now something that we also uh, consider from the very beginning when we are starting one of these projects. And there's also reaching out and, and um, sharing and communicating with other communities like it's a, uh, uh, a case with the Google Summer of Code. Uh, that also links with uh, helping uh, new students, new contributors to join the community. So I know it's risky. I'm going to um, mention one that has all these things. Uh, so the Antidote DB is one of the projects that for me is very inspiring because it has all of these things that I had just mentioned. Uh, it's one of the, one of the projects that uh, is part of the Sync Free uh, project. And to talk to you a little bit more about this project, I leave the floor to Vicky. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. So Antidote uh, was born in the Syncree project, which is a new project over there in, uh, in ESL colors. We were industrial partners looking into how to monetize the results of the project. We worked together with the Antidote group very, very closely. We achieved promising results and I think the secret sauce was the close feedback loop. We, we were working in iterations, we listened to each other. It was a good collaboration. Now let's talk about collaboration. Collaboration is a thing we see every day. Just look at the beam. Tons of independent autonomous agents working towards a common goal. And sometimes in groups, sometimes totally independent. The result they produce adds up. Um, the unified effect has much more impact. Actually, the same was for the results of industry and academia. Not a lot of people know this about me, but I, I started my year-long career as an R&D fellow at a, at a non-profit organization tied to my old university was fun. I spent there more than two years and then I moved to industry. What I realized during those years that knowing the, the general abstract algorithms can be a booster of your productivity. Just an example, once I had an algorithm that produced pairs, but I really, really wanted groups. So I knew the properties of the relation between the pairs. Um, so I have found that grouping the pairs can be done by finding all maximal clicks in the graph. This was a good lesson to learn. Um, and since then I, I keep myself up to date with, uh, with algorithms and, and research. I tell you what, it pays back. Last year, I again solved uh, a, a tough problem by solving it in, in the abstract space. I found that ordering the configs sent to the devices is nothing else than a topological sort of a graph built using schema and dependencies. I believe following research, learning algorithms has made me more productive research made me a better engineer. So fellow engineers, I 
think, at least it holds for me, that it helps your career if you are committed to follow research results. It can give you and, and your company the leading edge, reusing existing results, reduce time to market. And well, it's going to save you time that you can spend on something really fun. You are not going to reinvent the wheel, no time wasted on that. That's great. And another thing I, I noticed when I was in academia is that it is so hard to get inspiration on what to work on, how to produce results usable by industry, by anyone. Um, it is actually not so surprising because I was in a bubble and, and, and had no idea what the outside world, nothing. Well, this has dramatically changed now since I've been in, in industry. I, I see real world problems every day and, and I do have expectations on the, on the proposed solution. I have expectations on the usability. I, I have expectation on the implementation. I haven't told you yet, but uh, I'm, I'm still active in research and, uh, and I publish my results regularly. Knowing the work, the, the challenges the companies are faced with made my research more impactful. Industry made me a better researcher. So fellow researchers, knowing the latest industry trends, the current challenges a company is faced with will inspire you to work on real world problems, have more impact. So I believe industry and, and academia needs each other. So how to collaborate? I don't know if you have noticed, but everything starts with people. Everything starts with people. Where to find people? Well, visit academic and industrial conferences, share your results and challenges. Listen to the others, be curious. Start building your diverse professional network today. Here at CodeBeam, we have a lot of industry professionals. Um, more than 200, it looks. Um, once you are connected with the right people, things will start moving. But it will start moving slowly. And please don't have unrealistic expectations from the other side. No company is going to fund the software technology lab in your university just out of the blue. And well, no researcher will commit half a year to solve uh, a problem in your company as their first project. You need to build trust first. And then you can do more and more things together. So I would definitely say start small help out in one specific project. What is your advice, Natalia? How can one build a network in your experience? Well, actually, after discussing the topic with Laura Victoria, we found out that it is a slow process and we need to be prepared for that. So even after attending uh, one conference, um, be that academic or industrial one, your network won't appear suddenly overnight, so be prepared to build it over years. Um, it might sound trivial, but um, we need to attend the events that our target audience attends. So if I'm um, an academic, um, I need to be prepared to attend industrial conferences, offering talks and meeting people there. If you are from uh, industry, well, I strongly encourage you to attend academic events and submit papers there. It's important to talk about your research, right? So people know what you work on and why you do that. Um, another thing is um, it's not enough just talk about um, your research. It's also really important to listen to another um, side and um, see what issues they face. So one of the academic events uh, that I strongly encourage you to attend is um, Erlang Workshop. 
And this workshop is everything related to BIM. These are languages, virtual machine tools, uh, security, everything that is around the BIM. And researchers, developers, enthusiasts talk about uh, their work, uh, talk about their site projects, and to submit, uh, to talk at this conference, you would need to submit a paper with a research contribution. So the next question that comes is, why would I, as a developer, write a paper? So the, th the first thing I would say is a systematic approach. So research is all about systematic approach. And when you write a paper, you would systematically write your design, you would systematically do the evaluation. And while you do that, first of all, you may realize yourself that there are gaps that you would want to fill, or you may find out that the problem that you were thinking so long about is actually on the surface as, uh, as soon as you wrote it down. Or you may find that there are more interesting areas to go on for. The second thing is a feedback. So your paper will be reviewed uh, usually between three and five um, uh, experts in the area. And these come from both um, academic and um, industry. And what you will get, you will get their vision on your project. You will also get um, the questions and uh, you will um, get sort of their, their vision on what you're working on and maybe, you know, points for future direction. Finally, it's a point of reference for you because when somebody asks you uh, about your research, you can just point them to the specific paper and they will read it and that may be a point for future, uh, future collaboration or working together. Um, so how to write a bear? I said um, magic phrase, which was um, research contribution. So if you've never written a paper and you have no idea how to do that, there is a support um, at Erlang Workshop and you uh, will be linked with a researcher who will help you with that. They will help you to write, um, uh, to write the paper, yes, well, by um, um, helping you with the structure and then also um, guiding you through different steps, maybe even helping you uh, design um, experiments. If you sort of know how to write, but you would like uh, some help with research contribution and structure of the paper, what and how to write, that's also possible, you're very welcome. And finally, if you're very confident, but uh, would like some review before the final submission, please get in touch and um, that will be arranged as well. So how to get help, um, get in touch either with three of us or with the uh, workshop coaches and they will help you uh, to link with the right people. So the next question that we would like to discuss today is diversity. And here, if we go to, um, here we have quite a lot actually to learn from Erlang and in particular um, Erlang message passing. So if we want to send a message, then this message should have very specific receivers, right? And then if we want to change the state of some process, then the message that we, uh, we send, it should be very meaningful to the process we send it to. Um, I believe that the problem, currently the problem with uh, diversity are generic messages. They don't have specific audience and they don't have specific message that they target. And what we get in as a result is frustration. So people who don't experience this uh, specific discrimination, um, they feel tired of listening of it all the time. And they also feel that actually now they are discriminated. The people who do feel, uh, do experience um, uh, a particular discrimination, they also feel tired and frustrated because nothing changes. So going back to um, Erlang message passing, what we can do, first of all, is remove ignorance. And we can do that, but actually knowing our team, knowing what discrimination they face and um, working and um, sending our messages specifically to, to those groups. The next thing that we can eradicate are assumptions and a false care. So 
um, rather than assuming what our team wants, we need to talk to our team and ask them what they want, what they believe would change their state, and then work with that. So as a result, um, instead of missed opportunities, uh, we will get progression and growth of our team. And instead of unnecessary complications, we will create planning and processes that people can follow. Um, so from personal experience, um, I wear two hats. Uh, first one is a woman in tech, and the second one is a parent. So uh, what I would say is um, I'm really grateful to people who helped me with um, leadership opportunities. And uh, um, rather than making assumptions, what I can and cannot do as a woman, as a parent, they just ask me whether I will be uh, happy to do that. And that was always accepted with great appreciation. Another thing is encouraging to speak up. So it's not a big of an issue now, but it used to be. And um, also there were people who would just encourage and say, tell me what you think at meetings and other events. What's your opinion? Right. Um, and finally, I would say is um, encouraging attending seminars. That was another really important um, thing for me, because sometimes attending a, a seminar, I would realize that actually I have um, this lack of expertise or I'm not good at something, for example, like speaking up or something like that. So that was really helpful to find out what the issue is. Vicky? Yeah, and, and you know, if you do it right, diversity can make your company more successful. Uh, McKinsey carried out the research in 2015, um, and you can see the results on the slide. How does ethnic diversity, um, gender diversity, or ethnic and gender diversity combined correlate um, with better financial performance? The results shows that companies in the top 25% for gender diversity are 15% more likely to have financial returns above the median for the industry. I mean, it uh, sounds lovely, right? But how to do it, right? And well, that's a tough question. That's difficult. And I can't answer that. I can just tell you my experience at Cisco. So I think my company is, is on the right track. Cisco believes in diversity and it believes that a diverse workforce gives Cisco advantage. Um, so at Cisco, we have multiple programs. As you can see it on the slides, um, for, the, for the underrepresented groups with a real budget. And well, that is a game changer because it becomes a real support instead of tick the box type diversity. Not surprising that uh, Cisco has ranked as one of the world's best places to work. I would like to mention two uh, programs from there. Uh, I would start with the shadowing. So it's like this. Before you accept a new position at Cisco, you, you can work with someone who has the job already so you can see what it's really like. It, I think it makes decisions more easy and, and, and more comfortable. The another thing uh, I would like to highlight is the, is the Women in Science and Engineering Forum that uh, brings together women engineers from different backgrounds. Sometimes, you know, we meet face to face, sometimes only virtually. But uh, when we do meet, then, then we discuss technical and non-technical topics. Uh, we, we listen to talks and, and yeah, and have a good chat. So yeah, well, then, you know, on top of that, I have the best team. So I guess it's obvious uh, to you that I like to work there. Um, but, you know, life is not only about work, right, Laura? Indeed. And to, to close the, the presentation, we want to um, remember the BIM community and also as part of the tech community that we have to find some balance with the, between our work, our passion for work and our needed passion for other things, right? Uh, um, this is especially true for people in underrepresented groups because at, uh, sometimes you feel you're in the spotlight because there are so many of you 
that you have to speak, you have to mentor, you have to, of course, have a bazillion projects in your GitHub for your nest CV. So it, that's not sustainable. That, let me tell you, in the long run, it might be possible when you're early in your career and you have lots of, love, uh, lots of energy, but uh, you don't want your career to end in a short period, that you want your career to build something that you can enjoy for your whole life. And that's something that uh, you have to have in common if you're on the other side, if you're a manager, or if you're someone who is in charge of hiring people, right? People need balance in their lives. It will make them better. And beware also of the imposter syndrome. I was saying, you don't have to be a mentor. Do it if you want. But remember, you don't have to be the best mentor to be a mentor. You just have to be good for one. And the same as a speaker. You don't have to be a speaker, but if you have want to speak, if you're curious about speaking, don't win that until you think you're the best speaker in the world or the best speaker you want to be, because you're probably going to judge yourself in a way that you don't believe you're good enough yet. Uh, so just go ahead and, and fight that imposter syndrome, uh, because you know we need lots and lots of people to have the better community to have a very meaningful part of the of this tech uh, world that we are and that we will uh, we will achieve when we all can enjoy the the trip so to say so uh to take home i will uh get just three things of we've been saying please engage with the community uh, engage because you will be better and because the community will be better, you will have more interesting projects, uh, your career will be far more interesting, far more productive, even your business, if you do it right, even your business will thrive. And of course, that will uh, pay back to the community itself. I'm not particularly fond of the step out of your comfort zone, but as Vicky and Natalia were saying, it totally makes sense when it comes to uh, joining a network of different people. So if you're an academic, step out of the academic world and go and see what industry does because it will pay back to you. And saying if you're, if you're a developer, don't think that academia, if you studied at a university, don't think that's uh, behind you forever. And if you didn't, don't let you stop you. Don't let that stop you from attending academic events, uh, as we were saying. But of course, for that interaction, that you will gain with different people, different uh, backgrounds, different points of view. For that to be meaningful, you know, you, you have to know uh, what messages to send, as we were saying. So you have to learn how to do that in a uh, meaningful way. Beware of your biases, beware of your preconcepts and, and go ahead and reach out with an open mind. And as we were saying, oh, collaboration, it will take time. Uh, it won't happen if you're not curious. And if you are invested, if you do that investment, and that's kind of a collective investment that we all do, it will pay, it will pay back. Uh, that's our message. And well, uh, so that uh, to close, uh, we will uh, leave you with this um, uh, proverb that I, I think was, it summarizes uh, what we were just saying very well. If you want to go fast, then you go alone. But we want to go really, really far. So let's go together. Thank you so much uh, yeah, for this inspiring talk. Uh, I think uh, you mentioned collaboration uh, between industry and academia, and it's uh, no secret uh, you know, with the speaker get together, which we had you know, for the conference yesterday, took place virtually uh, from Uppsala, where I think uh, you know, one of the many cooperations between uh, you know, Ericsson and Uppsala University started you know, back in 1994 when they started teaching Erlang. And we actually got a, a, a um, very kind of spontaneous, improvised virtual, view, virtual tour of the center of Uppsala, the castle, the cathedral, the Gustavianum, uh, and, and kind of lots of other, the river, the Fury Zone, and lots of other highlights. So yes, <laughs> um, couldn't agree more. So, um, you know, we have, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, you know, please uh, post them in the chat in the app, and I will uh, then let you go in and, and read them out. So we have one question from um, um, Aaron. Uh, um, Aaron, can you unmute yourself and ask the question yourself? That would be great. 
Because you might have follow-up questions, and this question is is for uh, for Vicky. Uh, hi, yes. Uh, I was asking about our. I wanted to ask about the um, different algorithms that were mentioned. One was about pairs and sorting a graph, and oh. where might be a good place to find some of these algorithms? Mm, right. So, you know, you have, um, who there is a lot of books about, um, about algorithms. I think you have uh, books for, for graph algorithms. Um, uh, then, then you have books for um, distributed algorithms or, or, or concurrent algorithms. I think Google will be your best friend and then look for the citation count. So then, then, then you are going to, to read the, 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 the one with the most impact. I would also add that um, there is a research gate. So if you register there and the paper is not uh, open source uh, on Google, you can't um, access that. So you go to a research gate and request that paper from the author and they will be very happy to share it with you. Just to add up a little bit, uh, also if you look for as you use Google regularly, you just uh, Google Scholar. And after you do that for a while, and not that long, uh, I think every week or every two, three weeks, Google will email you. Like, there's this new paper that is similar to things that you've uh, read or searched for before. And well, I, I tell you, you better have a label because <laughs> there will be many, many of them that look really interesting. Then you have to find the time. <laughs> 